Welcome back to the big story, Primetime. A murderer is on the loose right now, the brutal, sadistic murderer of criminal justice student Emet St. Guillen. So how did she die? And who discovered the 25-year-old battered body 10 miles from Manhattan? Those are just some of the questions retired New York police detective Patrick Brosnan and I attempted to answer as we take our cameras and we retrace the footsteps of a beautiful young college student. Birthday festivities, where to go, what to do, and who's coming along for the ride. Those should be some of the only things on someone's mind when their birthday is just a week away and they're looking to celebrate. That's what 24-year-old criminal justice student Emet St. Guillen had planned one night in February of 2006. But while she was learning how to catch killers, she had no idea that she'd fall victim to one herself. Today on Evil Intentions, the story of Emet St. Guillen. Emet Carmela St. Guillen was born on March 2, 1981, in Boston, Massachusetts. She was born to parents Venezuelan native Semundo Guillen and French-Canadian native Maureen St. Hilaire. Emet's last name was a combination of both her mom and dad's surnames. Emet would experience her first brush with grief at only nine years old, when her father would pass away to the AIDS virus. Her older sister, Alejandra, looked after her and considered he met her entire world. She mentioned on different occasions how she felt a certain responsibility to her sister's well-being after they lost their dad. After a heavy loss, he met and her sister would become even further inseparable. Growing up in Boston in the 1970s and 80s, the Mission Hill section was racially and economically diverse, and he met and her family always considered this home. Emet graduated from Boston Latin School in 1999 and would travel to Washington, D.C. to attend George Washington University for college. She would study criminal justice just like her late father did. She graduated magna cum laude in 2003 and decided she wanted to make her way out to the Big Apple to study at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. Once in New York City, Emet found that the city that never sleeps was somewhere she was proud to call her new home. She fit right into the hustle and bustle of the big city and never lost focus of her goals. Emet lived up to her reputation and was known as one of the smartest people on campus. She was setting herself up for success and nothing was getting in her way. The future was bright for Emet. Loved ones who speak about Emet often reference her infectious smile, her love for fancy high heels, her love of board games like Taboo, and enthusiasm for the small things like when she surfed away for the first time in Hawaii. She made everyone in her life feel genuinely, deeply loved, because we were, said Claire Higgins, her best friend since childhood. Emet loved her family and friends more than anything. Alejandra would recall how one of her last conversations she had with Emet, she spoke of how she was somehow skipped at the last family Thanksgiving dinner. She never got to say what she was grateful for. She said she was most grateful for the unconditional love of her family, Alejandra recalled. Claire Higgins even remembers what her best friend wore that cold night on February 24th of 2006. She wore a sleeveless turquoise top and a beaded necklace. The top showed off tan lines from a trip Emet had taken not long before. Emet spent some of the night in Claire's apartment with Claire's older sister, 28-year-old Carmel. Looking through the New York City bar and club guide, trying to find a good place to celebrate her birthday coming soon. The three decided on the Pioneer Bar in the Bowery section of downtown Manhattan. Once there, the three of them would head to the front of the bar and Emet ordered what would be one of many rum and Diet Cokes. A bartender would try and flirt with Emet, but she would brush off his advances and she responded rudely to him, causing an argument between Emet and Claire. I thought he met with snobby and had an attitude. I guess we were just getting on each other's nerves from being together all week in Florida. 
While partying at the bar, the girls stumbled upon an engagement party being thrown in a back room reserved for special events. Claire would have a conversation with a man she met while there, a Boston native like herself. But that convo is where the interaction ended. In fact, several men would try and make advances toward the three young women, but this was nothing new. The three kept drinking and having a good time. Claire recalls all of them having the same amount of drinks, but thinking to herself that he met seemed to be more drunk than anyone else. Once the clock hit 3 a.m., Claire was done for the night and began expressing that she was tired from their trip, so she suggested that the trio go home and call it a night. He met wasn't ready to go home just yet and insisted that she wanted to continue bar hopping. Claire would wait for he met so they could go home together, but she refused again. Claire recalls becoming upset at the fact that he met kept her there waiting for 20 minutes, only to say she wasn't going with her anyway. She had been text messaging someone at the time, but this would turn out to be nothing related to the events that would take place later on. Emet eventually agreed to leave the Pioneer Bar with Claire, but when the two of them attempted to catch a cab, Emet would tell Claire, You get this one, and I'll be right behind you. The two argued again because Claire didn't want to leave her friend alone and he met would turn around and start making her way down Bowery toward Kenmare Street, still very much intoxicated. She said she wanted to stay out. She wasn't ready to end the night. The argument caused quite a bit of a commotion, even prompting a witness in a vehicle to pull up beside the two ladies, asking if they were okay. They waved the woman off and continued to argue. Claire, feeling defeated, decided she couldn't continue to have this same fight and decided she'd go home but this would be a moment she would soon regret. She would call Emet from the cab about five minutes later. Emet answered and everything seemed normal, the noise in the background cluing Claire in, letting her know Emet is probably at another bar not far from where the two separated. She would ask Emet where the bar was, but Emet would tell her she didn't know the name of the bar or the cross streets. Claire believes that maybe Emet didn't want her to know where she was or who she was with and for reasons unknown to her. Claire continued to make her way home, and Emmett walked on to her next destination. Now we're here in front of 218 Lafayette Street. This place was formerly known as the Falls Bar. It was the last place he met was seen. After Claire left her, she never saw her again. On the morning of Saturday, February 25th, 2006, Claire's worst fear when leaving her friend behind had now come true. He met was missing. She never returned home, and nobody had a clue where she might have gone. The family filed a missing persons report the following day, while Claire revisited the downtown Bowery section with a picture of her friend in hand, hoping for some sort of clues or information on her whereabouts. This is when, by coincidence, Claire would walk into the Falls Bar on Lafayette Street, the last place Emmett was seen alive and a call would come in from Emmett's sister, Alejandra. At 8.20 p.m., authorities had received a tip from an anonymous caller at the Lindenwood Diner in Brooklyn. The caller would say, I think there's a body over at Fountain and Seaview. Dispatcher responds, How do you know? What did you see? The caller's response, It looks like a body. You should send someone to take a look at it. Alejandra was calling to let Claire know that Emet's bruised and battered body had been found. As she received the heartbreaking news, Claire recalls the manager to the falls, Danny Dorian, coming from his back office. As she stood there crying and told him that her best friend's body had been found, Dorian would cross his arms and reply, New York can be a tough town. What she didn't know was that the man standing before her was one of only three people to see Emmett alive before her passing. Dorian, who lied to authorities, stalling the entire investigation early on, came clean and stated that Emmett was at the Falls Bar the night she went missing, finishing up her second drink at the bar. It was closing time and close to an hour after Emmett had last been accompanied by her friend Claire, and Dorian would order one of his bouncers to escort Emmett out of the bar. Emmett wanted to finish her drink or have her money back, but those requests were ignored by the owner. 
He mentioned that he heard Guillen screaming at the bouncer outside of the bar, and a muffled scream was the last thing he heard of St. Guillen before the bar door closed. Now, here's an unsettling piece of info. The Dorian family were owners of the Falls Bar downtown, but they also operated Upper East Side establishment, Dorian's Red Hand. Police were very familiar with Dorian's name, since Dorian's Red Hand was the same bar where Robert Chambers, also known as the Preppy Killer, was last seen with the victim Jennifer Levin back in 1986. Jennifer would turn on murder in the Central Park and Chambers would be convicted later on. I didn't mean to hurt her. I liked her very much. He was handsome and privileged, and the press called him the preppy killer. But to police, he was just a 19-year-old kid with an unlikely story that seemed to blame the victim for her own killing. But the preppy killer case is another video for another time. When Emmett was found, it was clear to investigators that she was sexually assaulted. She was found nude and wrapped in a blanket. Her hands and feet were bound behind her back with three zip ties. She was tortured, had a sock stuffed down her throat while she was still alive, had her face wrapped in packing tape from the top of her eyes to the bottom of her chin. Part of her scalp had been shaved off and she was beaten and choked ultimately resulting in an agonizing death. Emet's body was at first unidentified since there was no identification near the body. Word of a Jane Doe on the Bell Parkway was given to the press to help spread word. It turns out Claire happened to read the Daily News article about an unidentified body and call cops right away. She mentioned that her friend never made it home that morning. She also mentioned that her friend had recently gotten back from vacation to Florida. That's when cops saw the tan lines on the body and knew that this was for sure he met St. Guillen. Investigators tried going in every direction they could to find answers. The surveillance camera at the Lindenwood Diner wasn't working, therefore making it impossible to determine who made the call about Emet's body. The days got longer and the wait seemed like forever. Nobody knew who did this and the monster was still out there. There was no suspect. They interviewed workers at the Falls Bar once again to try and gather more information. Dorian denied seeing Emmett, but a porter at the bar would confirm that Emmett was there and being told to leave by the staff. Another bouncer, Timothy Catella, would say he remembered Emmett and the bouncer who escorted her standing out front. The mystery bouncer was Daryl Littlejohn, a 41-year-old man from Jamaica, Queens with a long rap sheet. According to prosecutors, Little John started his criminal career at age 12. He spent more than 12 years in prison for drug possession, assault, and robbery charges. He was on parole at the time of his employment at the Falls and by working late hours at the bar was violating the curfew of his parole agreement. He denied ever seeing Guillen when first questioned, but during a second interview stated he recognized her face in the paper and said he only saw her and he had no interaction with her other than escorting her out as he was told. Witnesses in the bar confirmed these claims. Now, the falls was the main focus of the investigation. They began to collect DNA from everyone in the bar, and Little John in particular seemed to be uncooperative, telling other bouncers he wouldn't give them his DNA. This made detectives very suspicious. Little John had a history of posing as members of law enforcement with a partner of his. They'd pose like officers and U.S. Marshals. He had badges, vests, hats, shirts, all to look the part, and would use this to try and abduct women. He also alluded to working as a bounty hunter, and this confused investigators since they couldn't confirm what agency he worked for. Little John stood out to them, especially given what his background check brought up. Nothing but serious crimes. The night he met was found, a man on his way to work told authorities as he walked from the bus to his job, he saw a minivan parked on the side of the road. He saw a faint glowing light coming from the driver's seat, as if the person was on the cell phone. This was a desolate area where there would be no reason to just be hanging around, so this stood out to him as strange. Detectives obtained a court order for Little John's cell phone records. A geo map was created with Little John's records and it gave authorities a perfect layout of where he'd been that morning. Records place him at the Falls Bar, 
then Queens where he lived, then he makes his way to the Bell Parkway, not far from where he met was found. There was also a tiny speck of blood, smaller than the head of a pin, found within the lock mechanism of a zip tie that bound he met. The blood was a direct match to Little John. A degraded semen sample was found on the blanket that he met was wrapped in, but it didn't belong to Little John. This threw investigators off until a familial match was made and investigators realized that the semen belonged to Little John's deceased brother who passed away in 1994, hence why it was so hard to test and heavily degraded. A pubic hair was also found on the blanket, again didn't belong to Little John, but the profile showed that this should belong to a woman perhaps an aunt or a mother. They took a DNA swab of Little John's aunt who lived in New York, but it wasn't hers. Little John's mother now lived in South Carolina in a nursing home. With the help of South Carolina prosecutors, they obtained a warrant for a sample of his mother's DNA. A perfect match. This proved that the blanket did indeed belong to Little John. The indirect connections were actually more proof for authorities. Red carpet fibers found on Emet would also match a carpet in Little John's home that had been freshly laid out. The connections between Little John, his home, and Emet were stacking up. The evidence just kept growing. Now there was no doubt in anyone's mind that he disposed of Emet's body, but they were still unable to connect him to killing her. Once the media blitz started, it would play a huge role in the investigation. He was initially held by authorities because of the parole violation. During that time, Little John was tried and convicted in the attempted abduction of a Queens woman on October 19th of 2005. This abduction attempt was linked to St. Guillen's case because a woman called police after seeing the suspected van she was abducted in on TV news reports being broadcast live from in front of Little John's home. Prosecutors in the 2005 abduction saw court permission to discuss Little John's crimes, and prosecutor Frank Degatano said that the crimes fairly reflect his character. Little John's lawyer wanted discussion of his past banned from the trial. Prosecutors called several witnesses to testify to previous cases in which Little John was alleged to have abducted young women. Shanai Woodard, the victim in the 2005 attack, testified about when she was abducted. She had her head wrapped in duct tape and was raped while she fought for her life. She managed to escape by breaking from the back of the moving van. Police were called right after this. Shanai was still handcuffed by Little John and when she told her story, a detective came and uncuffed her, but he made sure to be careful with it because he wanted to make sure the evidence was preserved. Those cuffs from that case were later tested and had DNA that also matched Little John. Prosecutors later called the Japanese woman to the stand, also a student who had been assaulted just a few days before Woodard in almost exactly the same manner. A lawyer by the name of Joyce David would agree to defend Little John for free, but would then ask for $50,000 in public funds to help his case. David, who objected to both Woodard's and the other woman's testimonies, verbally attacked the second victim's inability to identify Little John in a lineup. While Little John had not been charged in the Japanese student's attack, prosecutors insisted there was compelling proof that he was her attacker. The DNA connected Little John to every case without a shadow of a doubt. He wasn't only the person who disposed of men, he was responsible for everything she suffered. Prosecution rested his case on May 28th, 2009. Imed's death would ring loud across the country as her family and friends bear the weight of the tragic details. Nobody could understand how the sweet and intelligent woman they once knew was taken from them in such a terrible way and what felt like the blink of an eye. I don't believe in the word closure. The wounds are open for life. The pain is forever there. Every day you wait, you keep waiting for something to happen, for her to walk through a door or something. No, I don't believe in closure. It doesn't happen, Emet's grief-stricken mother would say. In 2008, Emet's family sued the federal government for failing to keep track of Daryl Littlejohn, 
since he was a convict who was in violation of his parole at the time of the crime. In July of 2009, Daryl Littlejohn was sentenced to life in prison for the murder of Emet St. Dien. He showed no emotion throughout the entire trial. Emet's family would accept posthumous degrees in Emet's honor as nearly 3,000 people cheered on in Madison Square Garden. She would have graduated with honors. A scholarship was created in Emet's name with help from the Honor Society, ensuring that Emet's legacy and love for criminal justice would live on. Where Emet can go on, her name can go on. In a way, she doesn't die, she just continues. I'll never see my sister marry. I'll never hold Emet's children in my arms. Emet's loss is with me forever. Thank you guys so much for stopping by and watching today's video. You know, uh, Emet St. Guillen's case was a crazy one to me. And I remember this case being handled really, really swiftly and the authorities really wasting no time. But to really get a feel for who she was, you know, you have to look for pieces of her personality scattered throughout hundreds of articles on the internet. And I feel like the point of this page would be to kind of bring everything into one place so that you guys get a good idea of who these people were. And uh, I thank you guys for giving me all this feedback and uh, letting me know what you guys enjoy and what you don't enjoy about the videos, because it only makes me do these better. So thank you. Now I'll pass a few questions off to you guys. Do you guys think that the authorities acted quickly on this situation? Have you ever been in this position before? Have a friend that doesn't want to cut the night short and you're worried for them. Please feel free to sound off in the comments below. Just keep in mind, these are still cases that are linked to real people and they're still mourning. Now friends, remember, always keep a tight circle, mind your surroundings, because you never know who around you might have evil intentions. I'm out.